Sonia, you're so welcome to the Happy at Work podcast. I know we've been connected on LinkedIn for a little while now. I've really enjoyed your content and I'm so pleased to have you as my guest on today's episode of the Happy at Work podcast. Do you want to introduce yourself to listeners a little bit about your background and how, how you got to doing what you're doing now? Yeah, and thank you. First of all, I feel like I know you. We were just saying we just met and I think that we've had this incredible connection even virtually and I think I just appreciate your work so much and what you bring to the community and what you bring to the world and I love what your podcast stands for and everything that you stand for so thank you for making me a part of your world and inviting me here today it's just such an incredible pleasure so I had to say that first thank you so <laughs> much I really appreciate myself. it <laughs> <laughs> no of course it comes from the bottom of my heart so I I mean, one of the reasons why I'm just so glad among many to be on your podcast today is that happiness is something that is so incredibly important to me as a person, as a leader, as a mom, as a spouse, as a daughter. My really mission in life is for those who interact with me in different avenues in life is to feel like they walk away with a smile on their face, walk away feeling like I made them feel better or I taught them something or just that they, in general, when they reflect back on our interactions, that they have these good feelings and that they feel happier. So yeah. very much your your podcast just resonates so much with me. Um, A little bit about me personally. So I was born and raised in former Yugoslavia and Serbia. I moved over to the U.S. when I was very young, 12 years old. So I spent a lot of my formative years in the United States. I received my PhD there, my MBA, also middle school, high school, I lots of schooling, <laughs> <laughs> college, all the, all the different things. And started my career in the United States. I moved over, um, obviously, well, maybe not obviously. I moved over with my parents when I was younger. And when I went, to, when I went away to college, I thought... I'm going to be a medical doctor because in reality, I really didn't know what I wanted to be. And it mm -hmm. sounded like such a beautiful profession. And it sounded like a really great way to make the world a better place. And, you know, I started my freshman year taking a lot of biology classes, chemistry classes. I fainted at the sight of blood. I wasn't good at those courses. And I thought, well, maybe I need to self-reflect. Maybe, mm -hmm. maybe there's a different way that I can impact the world. And I found out about this area called industrial and organizational psychology, which I first heard the name and I thought, what? Mm. <laughs> what could this be? And when I started to have conversations with different professors and mentors at University of Michigan, I thought, wow, what a beautiful field. And I think that this is somewhere that I can really make a difference. And so I went to get my PhD right after undergrad because I loved research. I felt I really felt connected with with that area and I wanted to pursue my career in it and so had this beautiful fortune of joining career builder in Chicago after where I just had the most inspirational leader from the get-go that I probably could have asked for and I was in my late 20s at the moment and she just stood her name is Mary Delaney and she just stood for so many things that I wanted to be in life like this very strong woman mentor a wonderful mom, a wonderful spouse. And I remember the first time that I met her, she walked into the the sitting area where I was waiting for her um, in front of the office. And this energy that I entered with her was just palpable. Mm. And immediately I felt, wow. And I just, I learned a lot from her and I, I've worked with so many brilliant people. I lived in Chicago for 11 years. And then after asking our CEO multiple times to move me to London, because I wanted to for professional and personal reasons, mm -hmm. go back to Europe. I remember he finally said, Sonia, go, um, you know, I know whatever you do there, you'll be great. So make that move. And so I'm just forever grateful for him because one of the big things in my life is how do you find a way to accomplish everything you want to personally and professionally. Mm. And I know that it's not easy. And I know that it's always, you know, we're looking at trade-offs, we're looking at balances. But one of the things I wanted for myself, and that I hope now later in my career, I can set as an example is that it is possible to do that. And it is possible to be in a very loving relationship to show up for others as an individual, and still just absolutely love what you do. And so I, I, I moved over to London. And I just had the time of my life personally, professionally, I got to travel a lot, work in different countries, meet some incredible people, make some incredible friends. 
And then I fell in love with an Argentine. <laughs> <laughs> I always joke, I finally made it back to Europe, you know, after so long wanting to do that in my life and had this brilliant career. And, and I decided to take a chance and move down to Argentina. And I didn't speak Spanish at the time. Career Builder was so incredibly kind to me to move me over and allow me to work remotely. And this was in 2015, mm -hmm. like way before now, when you talk about remote work and it's so much more normal, it was possible then, but not common. But so again, I think Career Builder just set such a phenomenal precedent for me for the kind of leadership I was looking for in an organization, the kind of leader that I wanted to be. And so, you know, fast forward now, I've been in Argentina for seven years. I today work for Question Pro that we'll talk about a little bit. And I just adore the organization. I adore our CEO, my team. Every time I, I, I move companies, I always think I could never dream of a better team than I have today. And somehow I keep finding these incredible individuals and they welcome me into their work families. And I just, the people I interact, with day to day, like I can't say enough good things about them, like my immediate team, people I'm surrounded with. And even though none of them are physically in Argentina, and a lot of them I haven't met personally, um, or in, in, in real life, I haven't been able to give them a huge hug, which is coming one day whenever I see all of them. They are just some of the most important people to me, they feel like family, and they make work so incredibly fulfilling. And mm. so um, that's that's me. <laughs> I could go on a lot more. I won't, but I I hope it gives you a little bit of who I am as a as a professional and and as a person. Absolutely, and it's interesting you say about industrial organizational psychology because I think it sounds very sterile or something described yeah. like that. And and I'm not sure that I ever even heard that term. It's not something I knew about psychology. Obviously, that was something I was interested in after school but I think you needed yeah. some great like we have a point system here in Ireland you need some crazy points to get it and I ended up doing business which had a little combination of a few different things I liked including languages including Spanish so I do actually speak yeah. Spanish um oh, brilliant. yes uh, and um so yeah like just really interesting career path from that perspective and I think when it it comes to Question Pro. I'd love to know more because some people say things like, oh, it's like working with family. And I've worked in organizations where it genuinely has felt like that. And then I see yeah. other memes and things saying, oh, it's it's like a family yeah. care. And it's, you know, it's <laughs> like, so do you want to explain to people a little bit more about what you mean by that? Because I have worked in that yeah. environment. I can appreciate it. But then I also see the other side where people, where there are memes about, you know, kind of like just, not very uh that's not very polite saying things yeah. about what it's like but then i see the other side where um you know if if you treat your family badly that that's what it's like that you expect people to do things that you you wouldn't yeah. that, you know all of these kind of things as well so do you want to explain a little bit more about what it's like to work there yeah absolutely and i, and I totally hear what you're saying um there's certain boundaries there's certain things people want in an organization family means different things like to me family oh it's everything. I adore my parents. I adore my cousins. Like we, I, I married into a bigger family, but my immediate family is very small. I'm an only child. I'm incredibly close with my parents. I was incredibly close with my grandparents. Um, I have one uncle, aunt and three cousins, and I just absolutely adore them. We're like this tiny, tiny, you know, little group of people. Um, but I would do anything for them. So it's, it, I think it's really important that you say that because I say the word, family and to me it sparks a certain meaning mm. and a certain understanding but it's not the same for everyone and also I've had really important organ conversations with people that people want different things out of relationships with their colleagues mm. for me I think as somebody that's moved around a lot I crave relationships I crave like I was telling you like I want people who interact with me to feel like they're better off for having known me which means I, I need to give something to that relationship. Mm -hmm. And which means that in some ways I'm looking for something in return because you don't want to just your positive energy to go to towards someone and just bounces off. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't feel good to the person, but for others, you know, they go in and they say, listen, like I, I really enjoy my job. I enjoy my career. I enjoy people that I'm surrounded with, but we're not necessarily going to, you know, spend a significant amount of time talking about family. And I'm not necessarily going to share a lot about myself. And I think that's okay. Mm -hmm. I, I want to be also very clear that I don't expect for everyone to go in 
and create these really deep, meaningful relationships with everyone that's around them. I think that for a person that cares to do that, it's important for them to select a company culture where that's possible. Yeah. And for a person that's not, that's okay too. And I think to explain a little bit about Question Pro, it's maybe even how I came to work um, at this company. So I mentioned I worked at Career Builder and all my positive experience there. And I started right as I was finishing my PhD in 2008. And as this, you know, like young kid at the time, I guess, maybe not kid, young, young lady at the time, <laughs> just going into the business world, mm -hmm. I was given this phenomenal opportunity to create a business unit called Talent Intelligence. And I looked around and I loved your episode about imposter syndrome because I talk about that a lot too. And I literally, I kid you not, I would show up to work in a turtleneck in a suit every day because I was like, what am I doing? Do I know what I'm doing? But mm -hmm. maybe if I look older and wiser, you know, people will believe that I can do this and I'll believe that I can do this. Well, as I was building this business unit, I actually came across Question Pro. And at the time we were creating candidate experience surveys. And I mean, Career Builder had 26 million people from what I recall coming to their job board every day or to our job board. And we had an opportunity to survey a large part of this population and ask them about their experience. How phenomenal is that in 2008? Mm. And Question Pro was a technology that I used to help build that system. Mm. So imagine I got very close to the CEO because we were trying these very different and innovative things. And Vivek and I had a lot of conversations together and he got to know my boss at Career Builder, Mary, very well and our team. And the volume of data was so huge that he even dedicated a server to us. Like he really felt like ascension of our team mm. and we made this work and we made this cool business unit and this cool business doing things that were very new for the time. Yeah. And so he and I got to know each other well, and we actually stayed in touch. And even when I changed roles in career builder and when I changed companies and I was no longer working with question pro directly, Whenever we could, he and I would get together for a coffee and, you know, we lived in different countries at times, definitely. In we never lived in the same city. And so he reached out to me a little bit over two years ago, because now I've been a question pro for two years and said, hey, would you be open to coming and, you know, running this workforce business unit for us? And it's all about employee experience and employee surveys. And, and I thought, you know, wow. Question Pro was such a significant part at the beginning of my career and helped me accomplish something that I'm really proud of, that it would be really great for me to be able to go in and offer that to other organizations now being on that end. How mm, great would that be yeah. for me to be able to do for others what Question Pro did for me? And so I knew going into the organization, I had, I had already known the CEO, um, so I knew what he stood for. I had a lot of interactions with him. I know how he treated people. I know how he felt about his business. And so in the team that you know I helped create, we have that environment that even though we're not in different places, I always start the meeting saying, you know, how is everybody? What's going on? And I always talk about my personal life. Like, I don't know if sometimes people are like, oh my goodness, Sonia, like not again. But I think it humanizes me. And I think for us that maybe only see each other on camera or oftentimes we don't to have a little bit, you know, less of video conference fatigue. They know everything about my kid. Mm. They know Mateo, like they spend time with him. They know how school is. They know how he's growing. They know whenever he's sick. They know when I'm sick. Um, they know my relationship with my parents because to me, we are so much bigger than what we do day to day for our mm. job. And in turn many of my teammates, I would say probably all at different points in time have opened up and shared things about their lives. Mm. And to me, that's really important because as somebody like, I want them to thrive at Question Pro. I want them to be happy to be there. I want them to feel, I, would talk, I always talk about feeling seen, feeling heard. They're all phenomenal people and they all do phenomenal work. And I want, while they're a Question Pro, for them to really know that there are the amazing humans they are and feel appreciated for their mm -hmm. work. And one day, if any one of them decides that, you know, maybe I outgrew my role or I want a big life change and I don't know if, if you know, Question Pro can come with me on it if I need something different, if I kind of want to help them take that next step. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's incredible how many of my former colleagues from my pre previous jobs and I'm, I'm still very close with 
And that's really important to me. So I guess when I say family and I've, I've seen, it's almost like that debate between like a leader and a manager. And sometimes mm -hmm. like when you tell people like, oh, a leader, well, not every manager is a leader and you don't have to manage people to, you know, to be, a, yeah, <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, okay, okay, I get it. <laughs> um, Like I get it, but I hope you know what I mean. And so mm -hmm. I, but I think you're right with the family concept. I think it's, I've seen it be redefined a little bit in work and different people talk about it depending on what's right for their culture. But to me, I think it's, for me personally, it's important to show care to my team members that is beyond what they do for their job, that it's that care for them as a human being. And oftentimes, really, I mean, maybe not in every case, but I think it's it's been really beneficial for everybody because people do feel, you know, I've, I've had people say to me, I'm going through some challenges in my personal life and gives me this phenomenal stability it was phenomenal to know that I had this stability in work and that I didn't have to worry about work in the sense around like is my you know, my leader going to still appreciate what I do? Am I doing enough? Am I going to lose my job? And I've, I've gone through ups and downs in my career when I've had those worries. And maybe, you know, sometimes they were justified and other times they were not. It's, it's hard to say. But when you're going through challenges in your personal life that are all normal, we all go through it. When you have that stability and the network at work and you don't feel like you have to really worry about it too, I think, you know, we talk a lot about mental health and we talk a lot about well-being and that has, in my opinion, infinite positive impact on that. Mm, yeah. I mean, there's so, there's so much that we could talk about from what you've said. I think what you said epitomizes the idea of bringing your whole self to work, being able to talk yeah. about what's going on in your personal life with your family. Um, and I suppose I'm I'm curious, I suppose. So first of all, where did you learn this? Is this something that you learned from someone else? And then the, the kind of the follow on question around that is sometimes people don't feel it's safe to do that. So like if they had a, yeah. a, a mental health challenge or if they had some personal things going on at home, that they wouldn't feel that it's okay to say that at work for fear of consequences. Like we better we better not give that extra work to Sonia because she won't be able to handle it because she gets too stressed or, you know, she has this difficulty or something like that. That that there people I think believe that there may be consequences further down the line for disclosing those types of things or even for talking about having a sick child at home well you know maybe she can't do as much work as we'd like her to do you know all of these kind of things and i suppose i'm i'm just playing devil's advocate here because this is the kind of stuff that i hear from from my clients from social media that, that it, it's the reality of what happens oh absolutely and I, I think there are a few things so how did i learn this or how did i come to it um through a very long process of learning myself better who i want to be when I was, well, it's funny because I used to say when I was younger and then I realized I still suffer a little bit from this is um, perfectionism. Mm. But in the sense that I think before the perfectionism that I, you know, I, I went to therapy for and, and worked on was in how others perceive me. And I wanted to be perceived as perfect. I wanted to be perceived as somebody that can do it all. And then actually the pendulum, I think, swung. And now that perfectionism sits on me. And me wanting to show up for everybody, me wanting to show up for my son as a perfect mom, me wanting to not disappoint people at work, but not caring about perceptions, caring about fulfilling what I believe is my duty to others. Now, what I realized and why I think that this, why I started to share so much of it is that I would get comments from people along the lines of like, I don't know how you do it all. I mm. don't know how you so flawlessly, you know, accomplish all these things. I don't. And I thought, oh my gosh, I don't. I don't yeah. and I actually get goosebumps even still talking about it because I'm like, I do not want to be perceived as that person. Like there are things that are really hard for me. I have phenomenal days and I have really hard days mm. and I suffer from guilt and I always like worry that I'm disappointing people. And so 
part of the reason why I wanted to share a lot of that and why I started to share a lot of that is because of all these things that you're saying, like on social media and putting people putting pressures on themselves. Mm -hmm. And to me, I thought I wanted to inspire people in the way that when there are things that are really hard, we can and we will come out of it and that it's okay to be sad and that it's okay to acknowledge that something is difficult and then that too shall pass but not give this perception that things come easy they don't like mm-hmm. life is not easy and so I in some ways started to overshare that because I was so incredibly worried that I was putting this image out into the world that I didn't want to yeah I don't want like I and and so I would tell people when my kid is not feeling well and I mm-hmm. would tell people when I'm sad and I mm-hmm. would tell people where I, I felt like I'm failing the team and I want to do so much more and I don't know how um, because I wanted them to know that w- the times when they feel like that because mm-hmm. I know they will, they're not alone. And so I think that that was that tipping point for me. Now, I think you ask such a brilliant question around, well, what if it backfires? And you know what? I don't think there are answers for that. I think that to me, again, a big reason why I'm a question pro is that my leader, our CEO, Vivek, has never questioned me. He's never micromanaged me. Whenever I've had time, he's given it to me. It is incredible how embracing he is. And I didn't always have that in my career. I've had some phenomenal leaders. And I've also had maybe some that didn't give me what I needed. I don't Mm. want to say they're not good leaders. I would say that they were not a good match for what I needed. And goodness, you know, he is like, I felt that I feel every day valued and that he trusts me and I feel supported and I'm infinitely grateful for that. And that's why I went to give that to my team. Now, if somebody comes to me to your point and says, Sonia, I'm struggling with this. I need time for this. That happens. And it's happened with my team and I want them to, and I do the best that I can. Mm. I do the best that I can in that moment to say, what do you need? Do you need us to change your targets? Do you and or goals? Do you need a little bit of time off? Do you need me to help you with certain things? Like, how can I show up for you mm-hmm. that we can work through this together? But it's not easy because sometimes people don't know what they need. Mm-hmm. And sometimes people don't know how long it's going to take them. But what I do know is that when you're when they're going through something really difficult, it is going to impact them, whether they tell me or not. But if they don't tell me, I don't know to be there to support them. Mm-hmm. And probably it is going to cause them more anxiety and stress because they're going to try to hide it, but it will start to show up in different things. And then what do we do? And so what I try to do, and it's, you know, one thing that is incredible, and sometimes I get emotional when I talk about it because it's such complex things that, that happen in humans' lives, is that when you open the door for people to share that, you don't, you start to realize how many people are going through different things, Mm. but how many people are going through big things that if they could ask for help with, they would. Mm. And so in my opinion, it's, it's not easy. It's not normalized, but I think the more we talk about it, the more we can learn from each other on how to deal with it um, as managers, leaders on the organizational level. But if we don't talk about it, more often than not, to your point, people will say, okay, I can either, you know, take a risk and share this and it could have negative repercussions, or I can continue to do likely what I've done my entire life, which is not talk about it mm-hmm. and hope for the best and hope that I don't mess up somewhere. And I think to me, it's, I, I, I talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion a lot. And I was actually talking about it with my husband, who's in a completely different field than we are. Like he's, you know, like oil and gas, business development, but he he's a really great listener. <laughs> <laughs> so he appeases me with these discussions. And, you know, I was saying that I, I think that there's still so many challenges in that field because it's not an easy solution. Mm. And I gave an example of myself, you know, when I was younger and I didn't have kids, I worked a lot. I worked Mm. many hours, not because I ever felt like I had to, but because I wanted to. And I felt because I was getting more done, I was advancing faster, right? Mm -hmm. Well, fast forward a couple of decades and I have a four-year-old and I still work really, really hard, but I'm very careful to give my nights to him Mm. because I decided I chose to be a mom. Yeah, And I want to be a really, really good one to him. But if I can only show up a few hours a week, that's not enough. Mm. And so I'm very clear with everyone that, you know, I will generally be on in my computer no later, later than nine. I'm available for meetings until six. And then I need to go 
I knew, I want to go. Actually, I should be careful about the words. I want to go. I want to spend time with him. I want to play with him. I want to make us a good dinner so he can see, you know, healthy food and good habits. And now the question becomes, if you take the young Sanya and the, I won't call me old Sanya, the current Sanya, <laughs> um, the number of hours going into the work was different. Mm. If somebody chooses not to have kids, if somebody chooses, you know, to have a different kind of help, it'll be easier for them to advance if they're working hard and smart and putting in more hours. But does that start, you know, to continue to penalize women, especially mothers? Mm. Again, it's not an easy problem. And that's why I believe we're still struggling with those kinds of things. Not because nobody cares about diversity and equity and inclusion. It's because it's a really difficult challenge to solve. And I think very much to your point, bringing your whole self to work is not an easy approach going from, you know, probably as little 10 to 15 years ago that we were very much expected to separate the two. Mm. Like, that's just how you live. Like maybe every once in a while you talked about your personal life at work, but like Mm. it certainly wasn't expected or normal to now having this big change. But I think it's something we need to consciously work on to find the ways to do it. Yeah. Right. And it's still going to be a little bit of gray, but I do believe it's something that's worth fighting for, for us Mm. to, to start to understand that we are you know, this whole person, no matter what hour of the day it is and what meeting we're in. And so how do we best manage that? Yeah, really, really um, amazing approach, really inspiring, actually. Um, I wanted to come back to this idea of you saying it's about inspiring people. And and, and to me, you know, what I wrote down is permission. It's giving pe- other people permission to share what's going on for them, which I think is really, really important. And then the way you described it as what if it backfires? Yeah, what if it does? And like, maybe that's a signal if it doesn't go exactly as you thought it was going to go, exactly as you would have liked, maybe you try again and maybe it's the yeah. wrong time or maybe it's not the right place for you. Going back to this idea of what you said about your your previous leaders, that it's not that they weren't good leaders, it's just that it wasn't a good match for you because they weren't giving you what you needed. And I love this approach of asking people, what do you need? We're not here to talk about my research today, (laughs) but that formed part of the research that I did was understanding about people's needs at work being a key factor Mm -hmm. in whether or not they felt like they belonged um, and those needs being met essentially. Mm -hmm. And, And the fact that if you had asked me, what are your needs? I have no idea. I have no idea what my needs are. Most people, if you said, what are your needs? They would have no idea what their needs are. But if you ask them, like, what are the frustrations at work? What are the things that are holding you back? And what resources can I give you to help you to do your job better? Or what, you know, is it like going back to what you said? Do you need a break? Do you need more input? Do you need what what specifically is it that you need? So so I just I loved that. Um, Coming back to this idea of the um, young Sonia <laughs> working all the hours uh, versus present day Sonia. And, and, and again, I think this is a debate around the future of work and what that looks like. I'm a f- huge, firm believer in flexibility around work mm-hmm. and measuring work based on outcomes, not based on the amount of work that you can do. And I do think that that's unsustainable. So even as someone who doesn't have kids, if I continue to work all of the extra hours that I have and I don't put those extra hours into my personal life, into travel, into spending time with friends, with family, um, building relationships, all of those kind of brilliant things that don't exist, uh, not that they don't exist in work, but that they are separate mm-hmm. to my work life. Um, you know, it's it's about rethinking what our entire life is and how work fits into our entire life and putting the focus back onto uh, here are the outcomes that are expected in this role yeah. and not, you know, giving maybe some guidelines around how long it should take. And, and again, going back to the research I did from my perspective, it's this idea that if you're working to your strengths, it's going to take less time than if you're working yeah. on, you know, in something in an area that's not that's not a strong point for you. It's going to take you a longer time to actually complete yeah. the work than if it's if it's an area of of 
genius if it's an area of excellence for you then it's going to take you much much less time to achieve those outcomes but but placing the focus back on the out the work outcomes rather than the input i think is really important Oh, I so completely agree with you. And that's what I remember. Luckily, early in my career, somebody told me how important it is to work smart Mm. rather than just work hard. Yes. Um, And that really resonated with me because I did come, you know, somewhat from a mentality around, you know, you just got to put in the hours, you got to put in the work, you got (laughs) to give it your all. And at some point, like it's, I mean, even the return on that investment is not good. Mm. And I think to me, Um, You know, you mentioned like kids versus not having kids. And I think it's really important for people to know, like, there's so much more in life than kids. Like, Mm. they're so like you're saying, like traveling, experiencing the world, friends. And to me, one of the things that luckily I was still lucky with early on in my career is that one of the things I'm most passionate about in 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 life is travel Yeah, like that's like even, you know, now it's slowed down a little bit, ah, pandemic and, you know a child and everything, but it, you know, I'm still, I mean, I'm almost back. I'm almost back. I, I did a few trips this year, but I think like, by the time that I was in my mid thirties, I had traveled to something like 60 countries. Wow. And that's like every bit of savings I had, I spent mm. it on travel because mm. I wanted to see other people and I wanted to meet people. And that was one of the beautiful things that I was able to always incorporate with work and early in my career is that travel. So sometimes the hours being put in was also like, this is my personal interest yeah. and professional interest. And look how beautifully they come together. Like, <laughs> oh, I can go to Athens for work and I can yeah. go to, you know. And stay a couple of extra Eden. days. Egg always. Yeah. Oh, I was always that person that I was staying extra days, finding people that would go out to dinner and drinks with me or like mm-hmm. walk around the city or I would do it alone if I couldn't find someone. But no, 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 I, I don't I can't imagine a time that actually went somewhere without building and even Stockholm when I realized that I might not have an opportunity to go back before I left Europe. I mean, you would love to like I had a carry on suitcase because I was only there for two days. And I literally went through the entire city with my carry on suitcase. Wow. Like I just rolled it through because the office was a little bit like in a different direction than the airport. So I knew I couldn't leave it there. But I was like, no, I'm going to see the city. I'm going I'm going to like so hugely regret it. And so I think to make time for different things, then we're we're all multidimensional. And again, mm. at times career seems to have this bigger pull. But my recommendation even to, you know, somebody younger listening to this is, yes, I put in more hours. But if you ask any of my friends or any of my colleagues, I had a lot of fun. Like yeah. I really did. I was definitely not that person that was missing, you know, nights out or missing dinners or missing travel. I just somehow tried, I think, to be smart with my time. And for example, if it was, you know, a Tuesday night or Wednesday night, I didn't have many plans. I can stay at the office for two extra hours, but then usually I was still going to dinner um, with friends because I think there was some debate or somebody recently, somewhat controversially, I think based on the reaction said, (laughs) oh, when you're younger, it's important to put all of these hours in because it can help you know, escalate your career. Well, again, it depends on the person because Mm. to me, also when you're younger, you're never going to get those years back. Yeah. And a lot of times it's like where we're still like getting to know ourselves and we're exploring the world. And I think to me, it's always, you know, one of, I guess, the the things that I'm still learning and prioritizing is self-care and putting ourselves first. And I think that that applies to any age group, it doesn't matter who you have responsibility to aside from yourself, asking yourself, what is it that I truly love to do? Or what are the few things that I love to do and spending time on those? I think that that's at least for me, I can't generalize it to everyone. But I remember learning about some of that and talking to my therapist about it and just thinking about it differently that I thought, wow, that's so hugely important. And it's so hugely important to fill our soul, to give us the energy to show up as our best selves to everybody else. And again, a lot of the way that I was brought up was, you know, putting others first. And mm-hmm. like I said to you, it's, you know, part of my mission in life is to make others happy. Mm-hmm. But how can you help make others happy if you're not? I think yeah. it's, it's, it's possible, but it's really, really difficult. So I think that's that's another thing, I guess, regardless of what life stage you're in, 
and we know what you're thinking about to now we know a lot more about self-care. We know a lot more about well-being. We know a lot more about mental health Mm -hmm. than we did even five, 10, 15 years ago. And I think we talk about it a lot more openly that I can see. And, you know, and for me, it's trade-offs. Like I've gone weeks that I'll wake up in the morning and I'll do a yoga session. Well, the last two or three weeks, I haven't been able to, because there are a lot of other things going on, but I'll say, okay, instead of taking maybe a taxi or a train somewhere, I'll walk. Mm -hmm. So I'll still get a little bit of body movement and and it's the little trade-offs of what you can do at what point in time. And it's not always, even routines, like don't always save you, Mm. but consciously thinking about it and saying, what did I do for myself today? Or what could I do? Even squeezing in a little bit, I think is really important. Yeah, this is it. I I mean, probably an entire worth of, an entire other podcast worth of discussion would be around this idea of the hustle culture versus kind of the well-being side of things like yeah. where on the one side people there are some people who are still saying you need to get up at 5 a.m and you need to hustle and you need, you know and forget what those other people are saying because you're not going to succeed unless you put in all of that hard work and then on the other side there's people saying you need to slow down and you need to slow down in order to speed up you need to slow down and look after yourself because when you take rests and we take breaks and you're able to perform better when you are at work so Again, we could probably talk about that for an entire podcast episode, but I just wanted to kind of illustrate that, that that there is these two different ways of thinking. And and interestingly, I did see something else recently on social media again, where, you know, people are encouraged to switch off at the weekends. But this one lady in particular was like, I actually prefer checking in at the weekends just to make sure that everything is okay. And she feels better and calmer for having checked (laughs) <laughs> on her business that everything is okay rather than feeling stressed by not checking so you know i think it's figuring out what works well for you yeah so that you don't Where, there's, burn out yeah there's no one size fits all and i think it's interesting because there's no one size fits all between people mm. but i think there's also no one size fits all within a person yeah because also we grow and we grow through different experiences and we learn different things and that's what that's one of the things i always tell people is like just remember that whatever worked for you two years ago five ten whenever you have to to use your word from earlier, you have the permission to change. Mm-hmm. It's beautiful to change because we learn and we evolve and we get to know ourselves better and we go through different stages of life. And there, there's so many different factors that go in. And I will tell you, unless I have to, waking up at five in the morning sounds like a nightmare to me. <laughs> I just can't, like in theory, it sounds beautiful. And in theory, I know it's this beautiful still world and you can... But I, my body really needs sleep. Mm. And it's just something that doesn't like I, I love and I'm like admire the people that it works for. It just doesn't for me, but I mm. found different things. And so I think for us more to be, I think maybe a better approach to work towards is for all of us to share like, hey, I found this one cool thing that worked for me. So I'm going to put it out there in the world mm. for whoever wants to try because maybe it'll work for you. But you know what? Maybe it won't. That there's this not necessarily this thing of, hey, this is, you know, what we should be doing because it Mm -hmm. is what's going to necessarily help us. And then it's also for all of us just defining what it is that we want to be and what we want about a life. And I always share that when I was younger and starting out my career, I believed I wanted to be a CEO of a large organization. And I didn't have an organization at mind, but think like, you know, the big guy, like the Coca-Colas or Mm -hmm. like the, you know, tens of thousands of employees, like to me that sounded like making a ton of money and leading a lot of people you made it you made yeah. it in your career mm. and then when i when it started to evolve i thought well wait a minute i think that that's what i read about and what traditionally making it means but to somebody like me i can't do that and have another part of my life because the way I approach things, the way my mind works like probably even my level of intelligence like i would really have to just give it my all and maybe even then I couldn't do it like I'm not saying I could but then I realized I started to redefine what success is and that's why a lot of times I mean it's really funny how often I tell people that I'm in Argentina and I would tell you probably 99.9% of the people that don't know me just assume it's for work because you know is somebody that is a president of a business unit that has a PhD and an MBA like what do you usually move for you move Mm. for a big career opportunity I'm like wait wait I moved because I fell in love and people are like, oh, 
what? Oh, well, yeah. that's really cool. I'm like, I know. <laughs> like, it is. I'm really proud of that. And I share that because it's that, again, it's that soul searching. And if you talked with me when I was, you know, 21, 22, 23, and now in my early 40s, who I am and what I want to be is very different. And I mm. think that's that's just beautiful. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm so happy. I'm so happy that it's evolved like that because I found what makes me happy. Mm. Um and then I strive for that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's so relatable what you're saying, and and similar to yourself, I had this ambition. I think it's because that's what that's what's painted as society. That's who is kind of held up as the you know this this is what it means to make it. You've got the big house and the fancy car, and your CEO, or you're on the C-suite, whatever it might be, of some big global organization. And yeah, like I aspired to that as well until I realized I could be the CEO of my own organization and the yeah. CEO of my own career as well. Um, I, I must say, Sonia, this conversation has taken a completely different direction than I expected. And, and I did want to kind of ask a little bit about Question Pro and any insights, yes. kind of general insights that you can share that you think are, are quite interesting for people to know in relation to happiness at work, the future of work, something like that. Yeah. Oh, yes. So that's where really like my who I am personally and my career and my career aspirations just very much like merge and and Mary. And so with Question Pro, the organization, and, and I, I love it because I, I dabble in all parts of it. We have a big market research arm. We have a customer experience arm and we have employee experience. Arm. Now that I'm saying arms, it's weird because people don't have three arms, but you know what I mean? I know what you mean. <laughs> three, three different areas. Maybe yeah. Question Pro has three arms. And I, I in my day-to-day, -day, I lead the employee experience area. And really what that is, um, it is employee continuous listening. It's 360 feedback. And it's, you know, exactly what we were basically saying through our whole conversation is to help in, in my job, I help organizations better connect with their people and ask them what it is that they want. Um, how can they show up for them? Now, I'm always very clear that each organization is unique. Each organization has their own culture. Each organization probably has its own set of values and who they want to be. And so I think that for organizations, it's very important to be clear on who they are um, mm -hmm. and then understand how they're living up to their promise to the employees. And very much like I said, I would never say I had a bad leader. I would say perhaps I had somebody that wasn't a good fit for me. I also think that's true for most people and most organizations. I wouldn't say maybe with the exception of something that organizations are inherently bad. There just might be a better or a not better as good fit. fit for somebody. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. And that's why exactly. I was so interested in this concept of fit and, you know, based on my research around it, because I wanted to understand more about my own personal experience at work that I had some jobs that I absolutely loved. And I had some jobs that I didn't love so much. And I yeah. wanted to understand that for me personally. Absolutely. And there, you know, in the, in the ones that you didn't love, there probably based on my research were some underlying factors that made your colleagues not love it either. Um, and so that's what in, in my work at Question Pro, that's what I do. I really, you know, want to empower organizations to have good conversations with their employees. I call it oftentimes empathy at scale. So how do you use survey technology, but to really connect with your people at this profound level and get their insights and get their true input around what is it that you can do for them to be a better organization, to be a better culture, bring things to life. Oftentimes we realize in research that it's a matter of communication too, mm. um, that some of the things that people are looking for do exist, but they're not aware of it. Um, maybe because it's not talked about enough. Maybe it's not talked about, you know, in the right channels. And so and that's really my primary work at Question Pro is that connection with employees. Now, another thing that I do, because we do have this brilliant market research arm, is we do a lot of market studies. And you mentioned a lot of the research that you did. So we'll we'll have to chat and see if we can collaborate on something in the future on our very, you know, very much common passions. <laughs> But I, I go out, um, we have, this was probably the most dangerous tool to give to a, a researcher, but we even have a, a channel, a Slack integration mm -hmm. that at any moment of day, I can go and ask people, you know, whether it's in the United States, the United Kingdom, Mexico, Germany, like the list goes on. 
and ask them how they're feeling, how they're doing. Um, what they look, I've most recently asked, and this was actually one of the you know more surprising things that we found too, how many people are looking to proactively change jobs in the next six months. Mm. And we found that it was more than one in three people. Wow. And to me, that was shocking now in December of 2022, because you read so much about layoffs. And so me intuitively, I thought, well, probably a lot of people are just saying, I'm going to stay put. I'm not going to change jobs because if I've been here for a while, you know, hopefully I have better chances of staying than switching and then maybe being let go. But people are still saying, no, I want to find that right fit for me. Mm. And I don't feel like I'm in the right organization. So I will look. Um, another piece of information that we found is that 37% of people said they would switch organizations to be a part of a more inclusive culture. And so we're actually releasing a study in in January that has a lot of these similar insights on diversity, equity, and inclusion. But when I share this, we recently had um, a company event in Austin, Texas, in the United States, and people's eyes just opened so wide. Because if you think about so many factors that we measure, whether it's an exit surveys or culture surveys, you ask people about pay, you ask people about benefits. But when people are leaving, you don't think they're leaving at such huge percentages because they're looking for an inclusive environment, but they are. Mm. And so a lot of what I do, because I think it makes me a better partner to organizations to help them understand their employees, is do this continuous market research on how are workers feeling? What are they looking for? What's working effectively for them today. Um, we did a lot of research, you know, like around hybrid workplaces. And when that was happening around remote work, um, you mentioned one thing that I, you know, again, just agree with so much is that it's important for people to be evaluated on their output, not necessarily in the hours that they put in. And that's a hugely, hugely important factor as we continue to create these places where we do offer remote work. And when nobody is watching you and mm. for goodness, like the videos that I see that somebody puts like their mouse on like, a, you know, an electric toy. So they look active and slack all day. Like it just like, oh, no, 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 please. Mm. No, like I get it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, for for an employer to be looking and checking if you're active or you're doing work, like it's, it's just not the trust that we need in organizations. No. And so I think there are a lot of things to give ourselves the flexibility and the freedom to live our lives, work mm. included, the way we want, that trust needs to exist. And so, but I do think there's a lot of research because it is a shift mm. and it is not very much how we were necessarily living pre-pandemic. So anyways, how much more do you want to know about what I do? Because I, <laughs> my friend, I can keep going on about, it's like an extension of like my yeah. soul. So yes. <laughs> yeah, no, so interesting. And like, what you said about trust, again, it's something I've spoken about on the, the podcast before, psychological safety on a couple of different episodes <sighs> and trust specifically on one episode as well. That could be the topic based on what you're saying. That could be a topic for a whole other conversation. Yes. Um, I did want to come back to this idea of the 37% want to be in a more inclusive culture. And to me, it's a nice way to wrap the podcast episode because it ties in very nicely, I think, with this idea of bringing your whole self to work. And if people feel like yeah. they don't belong, it's maybe because they can't be authentic at work and they can't truly bring their, their whole selves to work. And that's why they're looking for somewhere else where they will feel like they're included for being who they are. Yeah, and I, I think you bring up such a good point there too, because I'm, I'm wondering for a lot of people maybe that have been with an organization for a while and have presented themselves in a certain way, mm -hmm. Is it easier to go somewhere and start new and bring more of your whole self to work versus say, well, I've been showing up as this person, you know, maybe with this guard and the shield for the last five, 10 years, how do I make that change of all of a sudden starting to open up? I think it's possible. I think much like organizations that are well-established can transform their culture, can make changes, but an organization has to be very intentional about it and has to proactively open that door and say that this is what we stand for and this is the conversations we want you to have. Um, give their you know managers, leaders any necessary training on it. But I do, I wonder, and we didn't dig into that part, but I do wonder if that's a part of the fear is like, mm. wait, I want to come out as somebody more open and different, but how do I do it in an environment 
that I'm so used to being a certain way. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that you've been masking for so long that it's yeah. almost easier to leave. And it's similar happens with imposter syndrome that you feel you're so afraid of being caught out that it's actually easier to leave and start a, in a new role where you think things are going to be better, but you know, they probably aren't. Um, yeah. But it's it happens, I think, all the time. Um, now, Sonia, the question I ask everyone who comes on the podcast, what does being happier at work mean to you? Oh, I, to me, being happier at work means knowing that you're going to have brilliant days when you feel like you've made it, knowing that you're going to have really hard days when you're thinking, am I good enough? Is this the right thing for me? Did I choose the right thing or is this the right thing still? But that the net net, that the overall when somebody asks you, like, I love this as a temperature gauge. When one of my friends who I haven't maybe spoken with in a while asked me, how are you? How is work? That you have this illicit emotion of, you know what? It's good. Mm. Even if it's maybe tough in that moment, that the overall, all, all of those struggles, all of those bumps, like, you know what you're fighting for. You know what you're going towards. And any moment that's a challenge, you feel like it's a very, very much worth going through it. I think that's to me, you know, the, the happiness, being happier at work is just having that understanding, finding the place where overall you just, you feel this, this happiness, this joy inside you when somebody asks you how it is. Brilliant. Love that. Love that answer. And if people would like to know more about Question Pro, if they want to connect with you, what's the best place that they can do that? What's the best way to do that? Oh, thank you. So for Question Pro, for my specific group, it's Question Pro backslash workforce. If you want to know about Question Pro overall, you can just go questionpro.com. Um, for me, luckily, I have a very unique name. So on LinkedIn, Sonia Lucina, you put it in, you'll more than likely find me. Um, I'm on LinkedIn very regularly. Um, other social media, maybe a little bit less these days or more personal, but I would say for, and I love to connect with people. I love to learn what people are passionate about what they're working on. So if you are listening to this and you would love to connect, um, yes, please, you know, come to my LinkedIn, Sonia Lucina, and, and let's chat. Brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you today. I think there's a few other topics for some future podcast episodes there. Uh, so watch this space for anyone who is listening today. I'm sure we'll have you back on again to talk about some various other topics that came up uh, during today's conversation. So thank you so much, Sonia. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's just been an absolute pleasure. And thank you again for what you do and for all the goodness and the happiness that you bring into the world. Thank you so much for your work. Thank you.